We're gonna call this growing in powerful thought life. How do you grow in a powerful thought life? What we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at how the Bible actually addresses what's going on in your head. Um, think about this. God has actually created you to be a new creation and part of the work of God in our lives is to understand that. Why has God done what he's done? Um, as, we, if you, as you guys are turning to Ephesians chapter six, go to verse 10 specifically. And I want you to draw, uh, think with me about this just for a minute. The term that's used in the Greek New Testament for eternal life is on a zoe, and it means everlasting life. But the word zoe is fascinating in the original language, and it doesn't, when it comes into the English, it loses its impact. It actually means it's a quality of life. So when Jesus gives us eternal life, everybody's always thinking, well, I'm going to go to heaven. But Jesus didn't just come so that you could be with him in heaven. He came to give you a different quality of life. And because he's given you a different quality of life, that actually means that you're living. And the word for quality doesn't just mean, you know, life without the spirit and life in the spirit are on the same level. The term that you use, Zoe, it actually means to be lifted up into a higher state of existence and learn to flourish in that area. And so the whole idea of being, um, knowing the Lord Jesus Christ isn't just the fact that I've been saved. It's that he has given into me a quality of life, and I have to learn to start thinking in that arena instead of, I've just gotten saved, and I'm just going to live like everybody else until I get to heaven. You actually are a new creation. You have a different quality of life, and you're learning how to rise up into a place of nobility and authority, and you have to begin to start thinking that way. And so... Isn't it amazing? The way that Jesus teaches us to think about our new life is he allows us to live in a fallen world and to be in the midst of conflict and suffering so that we understand this quality of life. Now, when you and I read that in Scripture, doesn't that frustrate you? I mean, why can't we just understand it and not have all this other stuff we have to deal with? It's in the midst of that place we learn to understand who we really are. And when we come to Ephesians chapter 6, Paul is going to come to you and he's going to begin to address an idea about how spiritual warfare happens and why God actually allows it. Have you guys ever sat around and think, so I'm in the kingdom of darkness, I'm delivered out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, and in the enemy's kingdom I was a victim, he tied me up in bondage, and he decimated every area of my life, both my soul, my mind, and my future. In his kingdom, I was a victim. When I was pulled out of the kingdom of darkness and put in the kingdom of the sun, he's trying to reorient me that I need to stop thinking like I'm in that kingdom, and I need to start thinking of being victorious in every situation. But the only way I can become victorious is I've got to be in a situation where victory has to come forth. And so here in Ephesians, he's saying, all right, so what is the enemy doing now? He's still, until people come to the Lord Jesus Christ, he's functioning in his kingdom. He's the prince of the power of the air. And he's causing people to do wicked things that don't know the Lord. And he's saying, now, I want you to be aware of this. And in verse 10, it says, finally, I want you to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So if you guys have ever heard the teaching on schemes, it, this means there's a strategy that the enemy works on in individuals' lives. He has a strategy for your life. And so isn't this amazing? God doesn't say you have to be ignorant of it. He actually says you can know what it is and then learn to fight against it. So the enemy has a strategy in your life. And it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers, and over this present darkness, and against the forces of evil in heavenly places. So kind of had a whiteboard here, and I was drawn with a black marker. I'd say, well, the Bible actually says you get to deal with evil in two arenas. And the funny thing is they're both connected, but you have to understand the source of all of them is the spiritual realm. So if I had a marker, I'd draw one that points into the spiritual realm, and then I'd put a marker down here that points to the natural realm. So the Bible's saying, all right, now think about this. The enemy has authority, but you're going to learn to fight him in his authority in the spiritual realm, and it's going to affect the natural realm where evil is expressed. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever considered this. 
when you, when you teach the church that they actually are the authority, they are the authority on the planet, it takes people about 10 years to actually believe that. <laughs> because when you say to them, you guys, we have several government, this was given to us by the Lord, but there are five levels of government that are in scripture and the highest form is actually the church. So when the church recognizes its place in the universe, it, in, it begins to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ and it ends up saying in certain cities, Evil is not allowed to be here because I'm here. And you guys, how many of you feel like, wow, there's just so much evil and I'm a victim. Now think about how Jesus strategizes with you. Remember, what did you guys want to do when you came to Lord Jesus Christ? I just wanted to get saved and join a Christian commune and just hang out and sing worship songs and stuff like that. And Jesus saves you and he says, no, I'm actually going to take you into this really dark place and you're going to not like it for a season until you figure out the reason I put you here. The reason I put you here is you're the change agent to change evil to good. Yeah. And so you're always being brought into a situation to know the goodness of God and establish the authority of the kingdom, but you have to begin to start thinking correctly about it. Yeah. And that's what we're going to look at. So now flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 through 5, and this is where we're going to be spending the rest of our time. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. I was uh, a couple weeks ago, I was laying in my bed thinking about a family situation that's going on with my children, and I kept having the scripture come to me, take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus. Now, when I was um, studying evangelism and apologetics, that's the idea of begin, being able to give a reason for the faith within you, and a lot of people like that area, and I've studied that. And um, they believe that this has to do with philosophical arguments, but as the Lord kept speaking that scripture to me while I was laying in bed, take every thought captive, I realized, you know what? I've studied the concept of it, but I actually really don't know what that means. So I woke up the next morning and I realized, this is fresh from the Lord. I'm going to actually figure out how to actually begin to think God's thoughts after him and stop being defeated in my mind. So let's work through it. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every, th uh, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, that sounds like, well, how does that work? We're going to look at some words here. I think as we look at them, they'll actually start making sense to you. Let's first take the word weapon here. It's really interesting. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. The word weapon here, it, it's a plural word. It actually means weapons or instruments to make war. And it isn't the fact that God gives you weapons. It's the idea of what are the weapons. So when it says God has given us weapons, it actually means that God intentionally gives you a weapon because the purpose of the weapon isn't to have warfare to be the focus. It's actually, if God gives you a weapon, it's because he, he expects you to have victory through the weapon. So every battle you go through, recognize this. You've been called to actually win. That's why God gives you the weapons of warfare. And, and because it's a plural form, it means there are different weapons for different warfares. And this has to do with how people think about things. Now, I actually didn't see that until I started traveling. So, you know, I'm born and raised in Colorado. There's a mindset over this region. Are you guys aware of it or are you in it so much you just think, what, what's that? Uh, the, the region itself, if, if you guys ever kind of notice, is there's, there's this belief system that God works with you, but God is disappointed or there's hopelessness in this whole region, up and down the, the plains of Colorado. Now, where did that come from? That came from settlers trying to come over to California. They stopped in Colorado, looked at the mountains and said, there's no hope. And they instilled that type of thinking. It became a stronghold that generations after generations started raise, raising up in this region. And whether you're born here or not, you come into that mindset and people talk out of their strongholds. Oh, well, I always start something and it never works. I used to come into this region with different churches, and they'd always say, well, this is the graveyard for these types of churches and stuff. Well, who says this is a graveyard? That's come from a stronghold, and the Lord wants to actually take weapons of thinking and destroy that. 
Uh, when I went to Kansas City, it was so obvious because I didn't live there, the weapons that were there were prejudiced. There was, there was all kinds, and it wasn't just racial, it was just everybody was prejudiced about everything in Kansas City. I mean, and people would just make blatant pre prejudice statements and that everyone just thought that was common. I mean, I'd talk to my wife and I'm like, wow, it's hard to walk just down to the local grocery store and buy something to drink because everyone says belligerent prejudiced things all the time and it's just considered normal. All right, let's keep moving on. The weapons of warfare are not fleshly, but have divine power. Now, what does that actually mean? It's, a, it's the Greek word, uh, the, the foundation of his dunamis. This is the word for miracles. But it's an it's a adjective, adjective of the word miracles. So what, what do we mean here? It actually means that when it says God has given us divine power to destroy strongholds, it's this. It means the same power that Jesus uses to do a miracle, to raise someone from the dead, he makes that power available to you to destroy any stronghold that a Christian or a non-believer gets in, in their mind. That's how much power God is willing to exert to set people free from deception. And that's why it's not just divine power. I, that's the way they translate it. It's trying to say this is miraculous power that God has made available to you for you and everyone that comes near you to be set free from a darkness, deception, strongholds, anything that they're caught in. God has given you the same power that he used to raise his son from the dead. He's made that available to you to deal with it. Now, I don't know. I, on a scale of how much power is being released, the Bible is trying to be very intentional in saying, this is the level of power that I've made available for this. And then what does it do? It destroys... Strongholds. Let's take the word destroy here. Uh, it doesn't mean just demolition. It actually means, it's kind of funny when I was looking at it. So God has given you the power to destroy. And so it actually means that there's um, what we call a foundation of, of what we call deception that people need to be set free from. And Jesus actually gives his power and it's become surgical. It actually means it's very specific to go to that foundation that someone believes in and decimates it so the whole, what we call, house of cards crumbles. Now, think about what we've been doing as we've been getting together. We've been trying to grow in hearing the voice of the Lord. Well, why have we done it? Well, it's fun, but why are we practicing it? Because when you give a word from the Lord, we say, oh, isn't that just, it, it edifies and it strengthens and it shows the love of God. It does all that. But it's actually a divine wisdom of God to go right to a foundation of a person, destroy the deception they've been believing for their whole entire life, and just decimate the, the house of cards that the enemy has been building for years. And our job isn't to try to figure out the darkness they're in. Our job is to get the divine, powerful weapon, whatever God wants to say, and speak it and watch him set people free. Yeah. Let's keep moving on. We destroy... Um, Strongholds. Let's take the word stronghold. Now, it's kind of funny. A stronghold, back in ancient times, remember before they had geographical places that were kingdoms, they had castles with these large walls around them. And that was the kind of the, the illustration they used for strongholds. But I want to be very intentional. When it uses the word stronghold, and it's talking about the Lord has given us power to destroy strongholds in your mind and also other people's minds, the stronghold, the word that's actually being used here, is there is a lie that has been given. Now, this is a, the interesting part. It's a lie that's been given, and it satisfies you to believe that lie, and it becomes what we call a place of security in a lie. And once you receive it as, I'm safe here, you can't break free. Now, let me see if, I can, if that makes sense. Have you ever heard people make arguments like this? I, she gave a good illustration. Uh, I guess Jesus just wants me to live with this broken foot the rest of my life. Now, she's not seeing that as a stronghold, but that's not God's will for her in that situation. So, you guys ready? It's safer to go to that place and then get caught than it is to say, no, I'm not going to accept this. I'm going to stick with this thing until Jesus sets me free, right? And God has actually decided that the term that's used for stronghold is actually is a term to escape reality. That's the word for stronghold here. 
So God actually says people have strongholds, and the idea is they're escaping realities because they think the stronghold or that place of deception is a safe place from reality, and it's not. It actually wounds them deeper until they get set free from it. Do you guys see this in your own life? This is what bugs me about reading this stuff, is I realize, oh my gosh, he's talking to me first before I have to present it to anybody else. What lie am I believing that's keeping me caught from being what God wants to do in my life? How he wants me to learn to rule and reign with him. Now, what, what are the lies? What, what are the lies we have to look at? And now it uses the scripture. It says, we destroy arguments. Well, what are arguments? Um, have you ever, if you guys ever talked amongst each other and you have a conversation with somebody and you say something like this, you say, you know, they've, re they've, um, they've comforted themselves or they've reasoned that's where they should be. And when you talk, when you talk with other people about it and you go, but that's really not the truth, but they've, they've kind of like settled into that. That's kind of the term that's being used here. It actually means an argument is people to stay in a place of a stronghold, they have to come to what's called the final analysis of the situation, and they have to make a judgment on it. Now think about this, when you and I think about something, what's your final decision on it might not be God's decision on it until he breaks that free, that's actually a stronghold in your life. It's a stronghold in other people's lives. Let me see if I can give you an example of this. Um, February was an interesting month for me uh, for several reasons. I spent more time in people's houses because of snowstorms than I did doing meetings. And I was in Minnesota, um, and they had a, a cool snowstorm, and I got stuck in a house for 48 hours, and I had a Sunday morning meeting I had to get to. And so the guy that uh, travels with me up in Minnesota, you know, he's like 70 years old, and, and I take him just so he can sleep in the car with me, and we're... we're <laughs> We're getting on the highway, and Minnesota is really known to be a good place to travel in the wintertime because they're serious about snow and ice removal. So we leave the city, there's no ice, I'm thanking the Lord, and then we hit this major ice, ice on the road. And so literally, uh, I had to drive 35 to 40 miles an hour to try to get down from Minneapolis to Rochester, Minnesota. And I had people passing me and honking at me like, what, what's wrong with you? Speed up, go off the side of the road. And we're watching people just go off the road all over the place. And, you know, that's a little nerve wracking. So I'm kind of holding the wheel. We're not talking or visiting. If he says something to me, I'm just like, shut up. I got to pay attention to the road. <laughs> and, and we're driving down there. We get to the church. And I've done this so many times, it's almost kind of comical. Um, I get to the church. We go into the church. And guys, I mean, since it's so nerve-wracking, I'm kind of like on edge, and my nerves are on edge. I'm, okay, I need to calm down. I can't just be bouncing off the wall. And so I'm trying to get ready for the meeting. And I'm talking to people at the church, and they're trying to tell me jokes, and I'm, hi, hi. And um, <laughs> I always sit in the front row when I'm at these churches, and I get up to do the message, and I look out, and there's no one in the church. And I realize, oh, I actually put my life on the line to get down here, but everyone else decided since it's snowing, they weren't going to come. <laughs> so we had like, I don't know, 10 or 15 people at the church. And so I was waiting on the Lord before the, the service, and he was starting to tell me people's names and some conditions. And I thought, I wonder if this person's even here. Now, this is how clever Jesus is. I get this woman's name. Her name is Kathy. And I said, well, what's her last name? Or do you want to give me any other names? And he says, yeah, Ruth. And I'm like, was that her middle name? And the Lord wouldn't tell me. And so I just kind of put parentheses around it. I'm like, okay, well, I'm supposed to call out Kathy and ask her about Ruth. And then I said, well, what is the word that's going to set her free? And he said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to start with this. She's had severe back pain, and you're going to pronounce her to be restored, and I'm going to heal her, and then I want you to tell her about her future. At which I said, what's that? <laughs> it's like, what, what is that? <laughs> so we were dressed right in the middle of the service. I looked. I said, hey, is there a Kathy here? And uh, just like she was talking, I love giving words of knowledge, don't you guys? Could you say, hey, is someone here have their finger in pain? And everyone looks around the room, and they know it's them, but they're like, but they weren't specific. They didn't call me by name and tell me my favorite ice cream and all that other stuff. I thought Kathy was pretty specific. There was only 10 people there. I mean, there's either a Kathy there or not. And I'm like, I'm trying to move on and look cool. Well... I guess I, Kathy's for another meeting. And finally, this lady stood up and I said, are, are you Kathy? She's like, yes. Now, 
as a minister, you want to you wanna be nice and say, oh, that's nice. But what I wanted to say is, what are you waiting for? This is embarrassing. Stand up. <laughs> I mean, hey, guys, we're real people. So uh, she stood up, and I said, hey, who's Ruth in your life? And she goes, oh, well, that's my mom. Oh, my God. I thought, oh, man. I said, oh, uh, this really is for you. I said, you've been dealing with severe back pain for literally a decade, right? And she's like, yes. Now, I almost got so excited I was getting words of knowledge right and not bombing that I almost just stopped right there and just went, wow, that's awesome. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's go on. <laughs> And I'm looking at her, and I thought, oh, yeah, I have to actually pronounce this. And so I said, so the Lord's actually going to overshadow you right now, and he's going to heal. And, I, and uh, if you guys ever have authority work through you, you can tell it doesn't originate from you. And all of a sudden, I went from this mild-mannered kind of Clark Kent, well, the Lord might heal you. And I'm, I'm yelling at her, and he's going to heal you now! <laughs> <laughs> That's not me, if you know me. And so... She kind of just shook, and I said, well, do you feel better? And she's like, yeah, I actually do. And then the Lord's having to remind me, well, remember, you're supposed to tell her about her future. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I said, what's her future? I said, hey, are you, and then he started sharing his heart. Hey, did you realize that um, God's not done with you? And that your latter house is actually going to be greater than your former house? And you, you've actually decided it's time to retire, and Jesus actually said, you're not even close to that time in your life. It's actually time to get retooled in the kingdom. Now, think about it. He called her out by name, told her her mother's name, healed her just to break her free from a stronghold that she was done. See how much power God is willing to release to set people where they're supposed to be going in their lives. Okay, well, let's keep going. It says that we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion that raises against the knowledge of God. And then it says this, we take every thought Captive. What does that actually mean? Now, the word here actually is a word of positional authority. So when it says, we take every thought captive, the Lord is trying to look to you and say, so what does that mean? That means that every thought that comes into your soul, you have a process that you go through with the Lord. You actually have the, the responsibility and the authority to evaluate who, who said that to me. And the, the word take captive actually means when a thought comes to you because you have the authority now to deal with spiritual matters, you actually take the thought and you take it through the process of deciding who spoke to you and what you're going to do with it. You don't have to accept every thought that comes into your soul. And so it's a word of authority. Take every thought captive. And then it says to the obedience or to obedience. A Christ. And obedience is really interesting because there you guys, this is what's fascinating. You ready? A thought comes into my soul, and when it says, now take it to the obedience of Christ, the word obedience is really interesting. The word obedience in the original language means to listen to a voice. So when I hear a thought come into me that says, hey, why don't you do evil or why don't you give up on your life? I'm to take that voice and go, Lord, what's your opinion on that thought? And God actually comes and lets you become a person that judges internal words so you don't have to accept them. Now think about it. Word taught to think autonomously, which means a thought comes into me. I don't know if it's from the Lord or not. I, I, it sounds about right. I think I'll accept it. The Bible says, no, you've been given a different quality of life now. Now when a thought comes in, you don't assume just because you've heard it 5,000 times, that's who you are. You now say, what's your opinion about that thought? And you let him bring his love and his opinion upon that thought to break you free so that you don't have to live in it anymore. Isn't that great? Yes. Okay, so 10 people. All right, let's keep moving on. So how do you walk in this? How do we walk in this? We, we begin to do a process that's called recognizing the source of the thought. Where did that thought come from? Now, think about this. Our culture teaches you to run and, and strive and constantly do all the time, right? I mean, just one thing from another. I mean, I don't know if you guys are exhausted, but I'm exhausted just living in our culture. Our culture looks like, uh, you ever see those little um, places in pet stores where they have those little mice and gerbils running on those, those little um, treadmills. treadmills, thank you. I look at them and I think, oh, there's the average American life. 
because there's so, the culture just pushes you and information and stuff is coming to you so much. You, uh, how many of you just feel like thoughts are just kind of hitting you all the time? Yeah. Well, the Bible actually says that not only do you have authority over that, you have the authority to weigh the thoughts that are coming in. Now, is that the Lord? Lord, what's your opinion on that? I, I'm in this struggle. What's your opinion on that? This situation's going on. What's your opinion on that? You actually have that place in the kingdom to stand before the Lord and go, I am not going to accept that just because it came to me. I'm going to get God's opinion on this first. And it's learning to train your heart to do this. And so there are two ways this word is used for obedience. It means you take the word of the Lord, the Bible itself, and let that be an opinion that comes to you. And you also look for what's called the, the active voice of the Lord, of God speaking to you. Both are what you weigh things with. So people are like, well, I can't get God to give me his opinion. Well, sometimes that means he just wants you to read the word, get his opinion out of there. Sometimes I'm reading the word, I can't get his opinion. I go, what's your thoughts about this? And the idea here in this passage to finish up is it's trying to teach you the act of obedience is to understand that because you're in a new creation, your natural response is to be turning to the Lord. What's your thoughts about this? What do you want to do in this situation? We have three kids. They're, they're, it's kind of amazing. Um, it's uh, fascinating to admit that my kids are getting to be in their 30s. Uh, my youngest daughter is going to be turning 30 this year. Boy, my kids are really making me feel old anymore. But um, when my kids were teenagers, my son went through this really cool season of kind of testing us about everything. He had, he had grown up with his dad being a minister, and he thought, well, that's enough of that. I'm going to go do what I want to do. And um, if you guys ever go through seasons like that, those are a lot of fun. And um, yeah. Joshua comes to me. It's snowing in Kansas City. So what happens when it snows in Kansas City? Ice is the normal part of snowstorms in Kansas City. So it's like literally the worst thing you can do. And he comes to me and, and we have this car that we have for the kids and he, he's now talking Kelly and I into let me go to my friend's house and we're telling him, you know, the roads are actually closed. School's shut down for the day. It's like snowing ice outside but I want to go play PlayStation and we'll just, I'll just go over there and all that other stuff. And, and he just pressed us, and if you've ever had teenagers, it's easier to just say go than to have a three-hour argument. So we just said, okay, go. That wasn't very smart. And he gets in the car, he goes down the street, and he hits a patch of ice, and he slams into another car. All right? So he comes home. Uh, do you remember this situation? And um, <laughs> I'm frustrated with him because um, this is our only car that we had for the kids on for one thing. We told him, don't do it. This is probably going to happen. So I was kind of frustrated at all those levels. And I wanted, are you guys ready? I went into my own thoughts on what I thought I should do in this situation. I'm going to just chew him out. I'm going to ground him and I'm going to take all his money away from him. That's how I'm going to solve this. <laughs> well, and when, then we had to pay a tow truck and I mean, just all this extra cost, What you guys all have to cover. And I'm in the basement and I'm kind of, I'm telling, now you get, I'm supposed to be talking to the Lord about it, but I'm telling him, you're, you agree with this, right? He, I need to ground him for the rest of, until he's 27, take all his money away from him. And I'm, I'm telling the Lord, this is the best course of answer. Uh, this is the best course for this situation. And mostly I'm just mad. And so I want to take my frustration out on him. And I'm telling the Lord about that. And he interrupts me, which just actually fascinated me. He just stopped me and said, now, wait a minute. Do you want to hear what my opinion is on this? So, oh, hey, yeah, that's right. So what's your opinion? And the Lord goes, now Brian, I'm going to use this situation to teach your son what grace is. And when, if God ever tells you this stuff, do you guys ever like wince and like, oh no, what does that mean? <laughs> like, well, what does that mean? And he says, now what I want you to do is I want you to go upstairs and say to your son, Joshua, I forgive you for this. We're not going to talk about this ever again. I'm going to cover the full cost of it. And I want you to know you're my son, and I love you more than I love cars. Now, it's not that I don't say those things to my son. And I, I actually said, I really don't think that's the voice of the Lord. <laughs> and, and I'm just like, I think that's the enemy. And really, the answer is what I want to do over here. 
but as I kept pursuing the Lord, he's, he's addressing me about it. No, I, he goes, Brian, you asked me to intervene in your kid's life, I'm going to intervene. He said, I'm doing something in your son's life right now. He's in rebellion. You're trying to deal with his rebellion by being hard. I want to show him what grace looks like in rebellion. Oh, no, that's right. So I go upstairs. It was hard. I mean, walking down that hallway, I'm just, oh, i got to go do this. Come into the bedroom with Josh. And he's, he's if, you know, when you discipline your kids, they have this certain look on their face. He has that look on his face, and he's just waiting for the axe to fall. <laughs> So I walk in, and he's, and he's just kind of wincing, waiting for me to say, you're grounded forever. I want your firstborn child, all that other stuff. And so I said, Josh, and he kind of looks at me, and he goes, yeah, Dad. And I said, um, son, don't worry about it. We're going to cover the cost of the car. You don't, you don't have to feel sorry about it. You don't have to talk to me about it. It's over. I forgive you. I'm going to cover it, and we don't have to ever talk about this again if you don't want to. And he just looked at me like, what was that? <laughs> and he said, are you serious? And I said, yeah. Now, you guys, if you, uh, I've done this enough with the Lord. I didn't say, oh yeah, God made me do this. I didn't do any of that. I just told him that. And, and he said, so do you want to say, and he, and he was actually trying to get me back into it. And I said, no, it's, it's over, Josh. I said, you're more important than a car is to me. And I just kind of left his room. <laughs> okay, so what happened with my son? Should I tell the end of the story, sweetie? Okay. Okay, here we go. So that started a work in him, which I found out later. So we're at church three months later. I'm teaching on, hey, did you know God's the father? I'm teaching that. My kids hear this stuff from me all the time. My son comes up to me and says, hey, Dad. Now, he, he wasn't doing this. After that situation, something was hard. Now, remember, when God gives you his opinion, it's a word to destroy a foundation of deception so that people can come into the goodness of the kingdom of God. He, he says, hey, Dad, um, and I was praying for, with people, and he said, I'm going to go over there and have someone pray for me about something. And I said, oh, that's fine. I'm going to be here with some people praying some more. And so I'm praying, and um, I think I prayed for a couple people, and then I'm looking around to see where's Josh. Well, like kind of where's my family, and I'm looking, where's Josh? And I notice that he's not there anymore, but there are a bunch of people gathered around a, a person and all I could see was their shoes, and I forgot the type of shoes my son had. So I'm just like, oh, I wonder who's on the floor. And I'm looking, I'm looking through the audience, and I see Kelly and my daughters, and I'm like, hey, where's Josh? And they're pointing. Hey, he's over there. And so I'm, I'm walking over, and I'm looking at him, and he's laying on the ground shaking <clears throat> like that. I'm like, hey, Josh, can you, can you hear me? Are you okay? And he says, <laughs> says, Dad, shut up. The Lord's talking to me right now. And I'm like, okay. So he just lays on the ground and shakes. And, and, you know, if you guys have ever seen this, then my wife gets up and she comes and prays with him for a while. And then she goes and sits down. And then my daughters come up and pray with him for a while. And, and everyone throughout the church just kept coming and praying for him. And then they'd leave because he'd never get up. And so finally, everyone in the church left. And the janitors came up to us and go, could you guys actually pick up your son and leave? We'd actually like to clean the church and go home. So we're like, okay. So we get Josh. We go, hey, Josh, can you stand up? And he says, hey, just shut up and don't talk to me. The Lord's talking to me right now. And so it's like, okay. So we just pick him up. And we're actually carrying him to the car. And we threw him in the back seat. And he's just, oh, oh, doing this kind of stuff and shaking. And we're just looking at him. And I said, well, so does, where does everyone want to go for lunch? Because <laughs> this is normal in our household, so we eat while we do this kind of stuff. And so Josh goes, I don't want to go anywhere. Just take me home. And we're like, what, I mean, do you want something? No, don't stop talking to me. The Lord's talking to me right now. It's like, okay. <laughs> we take him home, and he just he jumps. I mean, here's this 18-year-old. He's jumping out of his car and running to his bedroom. I mean, just full dash. And he slams the door. We barely get in the house. And we hear this bang. Like, what? And we're looking at each other. What in the world is going on? And so 
I went down the hallway and knocked on the door. Hey, Josh, are you okay? Hey, Dad, could you kind of just leave me alone? Uh, the Lord's trying to talk to me right now. And I'm like, okay. So I thought he was going to be in there like till dinner time. He didn't show up all night. I knocked on the door. He said, don't bother me. The Lord's still talking to me. And I'm like, okay. So we went to bed. Next day, hey, Josh, are you going to come out? Just stop talking to me. The Lord's talking. I mean, he literally is having this encounter for like 24 hours with the Lord. He comes out of his bedroom. <laughs> okay, now remember, this is how powerful God's word is in people's lives. All right? He comes out of the bedroom, and he, he kind of walks up to me, and he says, hey, Dad, where's your theology books? And um, you talked about reading systematic theology. Where's that book? And where's some books on prayer and church history? And I said, well, and I took him down to my office. I said, here's my systematic theology, and there's my church history, and there's some books I have on prayer. And he grabs about, like, what, 10 books or something like that? And he goes, okay, I'll see you guys later. And I go, well, where are you going? He goes, I'm going to my bedroom. And he closed, goes in there and locks the door for another 24 hours. <laughs> this is how powerful God is with words. He comes out of his bedroom and he says, um, boy, the Lord's been talking to me the last couple days. I'm going to grab a couple of my friends and I'm going to go do street evangelism. He's never done this before in his life. And now he's, every time he comes home, literally, he still does it now. Uh, he comes home and he goes, uh, what are you going to do tonight? Well, I'm going to take some friends. We're going to go do some street evangelism. And he goes out and he trains people on how to give words to people. He heals them in the street. He loves going around teenagers and praying for them when they're injured, and he videotapes it all and just posts it online. And all of that happened because God gave me his opinion on what I should do with Josh in the situation. That's how powerful God's opinion is to set us free from things. Let's pray, guys. You're so good, Lord. It just amazes me. Just come among us. Uh, we just lay our thoughts and our mind before us, before you. Would you come and let us begin to become sharp at hearing your opinion in our lives, your thoughts? Now, as for each one of us, teach us your ways, O oh God. Let us be people that tremble at your word. And I thank you for your goodness. Your goodness, Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.